Hi, my name is Lyle Murphy, and I'm the founder of the Alternative to Med Center. And today we are here to talk about a drug called Risperdal, also called Risperdone. So what is Risperdal? Well, Risperdal is what they call an atypical antipsychotic. Um, what is an atypical antipsychotic? It is, um, it's the typical antipsychotics um, had a lot of problems with the um, extra pyramidal uh, problems. Extra pyramidal problems, meaning tardive dyskinesia. Uh, sometimes I think we see this, you know, in a lighter form called akesthesia. And um, the atypical antipsychotics are, they're meant to, they're basically they metabolize faster so that the toxic buildup is less likely. But um, they still can cause extra pyramidal symptoms and they can cause tardive dyskinesia in certain vulnerable people. And um, it should be, I mean, if a person's having um, an increase in their excitability, unable to sit still when they're taking these medications, they probably want to go back to their prescriber and say, hey, am I having, um, am I having tardive dyskinesia type symptoms happening here? If they're having movements and stuff that feel jerky and uncontrolled, um, those are some big red flags. So um, question number two, what is Risperdal prescribed for? Well, um, I don't know. I mean, I wanted to say it's prescribed for psychosis, but um, honestly, the drug companies here can be very manipulative. Um, back a little over a decade ago, uh, Johnson & Johnson, who is the maker of Risperdal, was sued for defrauding the American public, um, suggesting things off-label that were not um, FDA approved, and also um, using things called teen screens, where they would go into schools, um, they would give these teen screens to the counselors, and then they would um, check the results. And basically these tests were designed to capture um, any sort of normative behavior and pathologize it. Like, do you ever feel like your friends um, are mad at you or don't like you? Do you ever feel outcast? Do you ever feel left out? Things that any teen, especially teen females, are gonna feel, and um, they got caught doing it uh, to the tone of billions. And you would think that if you are um, defrauding the American public and sued by a state like the state of Texas, that you probably would be put out of business um, and put in jail. But no, um, they were fined. And uh, again, here recently, especially in 2020, there are tens of thousands of lawsuits against Johnson Johnson for Respiral. And somehow these people, um, they had an 8 billion lawsuit and it got reduced down into the low millions, like 6.2 million, I believe, um, after further review. Still, again, defrauding the American public and um, they just keep getting away with it. So um, I don't know, I find it kind of strange. If, if I were to do that or you were to do that, um, I don't think we would survive that so well. But um, um, I don't know that we necessarily live in an equanimous world when it comes to, um, uh, you know, how, I mean, the, the, type of, the type of defrauding that happened here with this particular medication should have had jail time associated with it. And it, it didn't, it just had fines. And those fines really actually, what they represent are real people's lives, real people dying, real people being poisoned, real people having loss of their children or having loss of a loved one. And them being fined, and then that's that. Uh, it's kind of sickening, really. So um, I guess it can be prescribed for just about anything, uh, uh, even a bad diet, but um, a hypoglycemic event or a kundalini awakening or um, having a fight with your parents, um, um, being an outcast at school. But um, usually it's prescribed when you know someone has gone into a psychotic state and um, is delusional and to bring them back down. Question number three, is Risperdal safe? Um, I guess it depends on who you ask. Um, if you're asking me, I would say definitely no. Um, I mean, of course, running around out there being a danger to yourself is not safe either. So um, I'm not trying to be, you know, um, um, too fantastical with the, the approach on this. Um, there are times in our society, in the American society, where the only option we have sometimes is to take somebody to the hospital. We don't have, you know, a place like a rubberized environment that um, uh, has good 
spiritual type counselors to guide people through these things and feed them organic food and to kind of process through whatever is coming up and work with it and amalgamize it into a way that um, actually form, firmaments their um, spirit. We have a society where, you know, if you're running around and you could get run over by cars or you could fall, try to fly off of a, of a, of a roof or a parking garage or, you know, a variety of things where, um, you know, going to the hospital is really the only option that we have in our current society. Um, but the antipsychotic classes are, are usually, um, they do a certain thing to the nervous system that can be very um, debilitating. So our, um, what the drug is believed to do is to restrict the amount of dopamine that's getting released from the synapse. So um, my hands here are gonna represent a synapse. This is the originating neuron. This is where the dopamine is held is inside of this hand, inside of what are called vesicles. This nerve basically would just be like, you've got one of these, but on the other side, there's an opening here called the synapse. So this nerve is talking to the next nerve down the chain and saying, hey, there's a stimulation over here. There's, a, there's an attractive person over there that you, you wanna look at, or there's a job over there that might give you a reward, or there's, um, there's a way that you can survive by making a connection here. There's a beautiful purse. There's, um, you know, um, something shiny, bright object, you know, that has a certain reward that's attached to it and sends a signal. Okay, so the dopamine is released. It comes out, tickles the receptors, and then this side, using a dopamine transport system, pulls the dopamine back in so it can get used again. Well, if a person's in dopamine excess, everything is rewarding. I mean, everything. Everything becomes super stimulating. Um, usually, it looks like. Um, um, sort of manic uh, hyperfixation on sexuality, um, being paranoid, or religious ide ideation. But it can be a combination of different things. Um, but everything has become sort of stimulating. So what the drug is meant to do is it's meant to um, make it so that this um, it's sort of paved over a little bit where the dopamine can't get out to talk to this side. Well, dopamine also is involved in your survival. So me holding my spine erect, me being attentive to my environment, being able to place my foot on the ground without um, slipping and having the correct um, articulation and proprioception to do that, uh, survive basically is um, part of that is the dopamine um, expression. So when that's cut off, the body is very phenomenal at being able to adapt itself in order to survive. So what does it do? it builds more dopamine receptors on this side. So the little bit that's getting through has a higher chance of exciting something and creating that necessary stimulation. So the need for the drug goes up, 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 up. And now try to imagine what happens when you come off this drug. So when you start to come off of this drug, it, um, uh, you're releasing more dopamine now into these hypervolatile upregulated receptors. So that in itself can cause um, uh, dopamine excess. And dopamine excess, just from the withdrawal alone, like let's, let's create this imaginary person. We have Dave, right? And Dave had a hypoglycemic event. Let's say he had low blood sugar and he started acting manic because when your brain is starving, it's going to do crazy things, right? And you're going to hallucinate because you're actually having some form of potential brain death. So Dave goes into hypoglycemia and he goes, or maybe Dave smoked some pot and he doesn't metabolize cannabinoids well. Or maybe Dave um, snorted his Adderall at school. Anyway, so whatever's happening with Dave wasn't like a diagnosis where you're, some part of your brain is broken, right? It's, there's a reason why this happened, right? Now Dave gets put on an antipsychotic and he's on it for a while. When Dave starts to try to come off this antipsychotic, he's going to have this dopamine excess that's going to look just like mania. So it's going to get confused as to why Dave is symptomatic trying to come off these medications. Then they're going to say, well, you need more of those medications. Because of course, you know, you're this diagnosis. You're, you know, you are schizoaffective or you're schizophrenic. Or um, the difference to me between someone who's a good candidate to come off of their um, antipsychotics and one who may have more challenges, I, I don't want to say anyone's not a good candidate, but there's definitely those that have um, like, oh, that's, that's, you know, that's, that's the type that didn't need this in the first place. Is the person, if the person's having intermittent symptoms, in other words, 
they're high functioning. Um, I know there are times they're a train wreck, uh, especially if that train wreck is associated with hypoglycemia, smoking pot, doing a stimulant, even coffee, on these types of medications, uh, or not taking the medication regularly, and they go like that, then that's the person who's generally not broken. Because if it works some of the time, it's not broken. They just need to be in a stabilized environment and do it slowly enough, maybe even using some bridge medications in order to be able to um, navigate this withdrawal. I'm just checking real quick to make sure I'm not intruding on other questions. Um, <clears throat> I sort of am. So question number four was, what does Respiradol do to the brain? Um, what I was saying with that is, is that it, it, it can cause a situation that may have not even existed in that same way in the first place. It may create a dopamine um, uh, dysregulation, right? To where you've built up more receptors. The, the, the actual genetic um, uh, range, like people with different genetics respond differently, but there's anywhere from a 37 to a 98% uptick in how these receptors can upregulate when you're holding back dopamine. So it's kind of like if you're holding back iPhones at the, and all of a sudden you let go of iPhones. I mean, it's some people like me wouldn't be interested in an iPhone that much. I mean, maybe I'll get one later, but some people are like, oh my God, I got to have that thing. So based upon the different up regulation can determine how mm, malfeasant this, this, this um, neuroadaptation can be in different people. So um, that's what's generally happening. Um, now, how do I get off Risperdal? <clears throat> this, um, this is one of those, uh, this is one of those, uh, medication withdrawals that just kind of comes with that. Um, do you really want to try this at home? Cause, uh, I mean, I, I want to encourage people to, 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 to find alternatives to antipsychotics. These are, these are, these are very difficult drugs. Um, a person who has been symptomatic all the time that hasn't seen a bright moment in 10 years, and um, they are hearing voices, especially disparaging voices that are telling them um, bad things about themselves or the people. Um, those are the people that are going to have to either go really, really slow, or maybe, you know, there's a place in there where the lowest amount of medication is what it takes for them to have the, the highest functioning life, okay? Um, I don't want to pass any judgment on that. There are also people who, you know, they didn't need to be on it in the first place, but now they're stuck in that mess, right? So now there's that neuroadaptation that's occurred. Well, just like the neuroadaptation had to go this way, right? You had to build more receptors and it took time to do that. In order to now downregulate, you need time for those receptors to now go, oh, I don't need that much stimulation anymore. So one is slowly come off of this medication. You, it's approximately one month for every one year that a person has been on um, uh, antipsychotic like Risperdal. Does that mean if I've been on it for one year, I can get off it for one month? No, no. It means that maybe you, like there's <laughs> there's a bit of a, bell, a curve to it. I don't mathematically how to represent it, but um, if you've been on it for one year, it might take three months, you know? If you've been on it for 10 years, it's probably gonna take 10 months or a year, you know? So it's, it's not something you wanna get too adventurous with because obviously, if you go too fast, you could end up back in the hospital. And that leaves a tainted, tarnished effect on everyone. I mean, everyone's like, well, wow, look what happened when you did that. So going slow is a way to get through this. A person can only go as fast as they can go. So this medication may have paved over a lot of things. It may have paved over what religion a person believes they are, what sex a person believes that they are, or that what sex they're interested in in other people. Um, whether they agree with their parents or their government or their society, I mean, all of those things may have not been relevant on this medication. But when you start to pull it back, all of a sudden, whew, like all that stuff becomes so mm, loud in the brain that um, in and of itself, wrestling with these things is actually necessary for our growth and our development and our establishment of who we are and what we truly believe. But if it's going too fast, it's kind of like a train going too fast. It, it, it's going to fly off the rails. So imagine this withdrawal being like you're driving a logging truck down an icy mountain. There's switchback corners. And if you go too fast, you could slip off the mountain. Well, when you're pulling back this drug, it's like stepping on the accelerator, right? So obviously you 
don't want the accelerator going too fast, faster than the corners you're going around. So stuff is going to come up, but you want it to come up and have the space and time to integrate. So let's say your parents working with a child, you want them to, it's good if a person has a routine, if they have been working a job or if they have been having some sort of thing that they're responsible for, like a um, exercise routine or something that they can kind of drop back into in case they start to get, things start to get a bit wobbly, right? It's good to have a routine to drop back into. Some people haven't had a routine in 10 years, so <clears throat> um, you may have to pull back a little of the medication even and get them inspired in something to have a routine. But um, you know, having some sort of work where there's a financial compensation, you know, even if it's just chores, um, um, something, you know. But you want to set aside the time and the space to do this. You want to make sure that um, a person's eating well because you don't want them tandeming up um, uh, um, hypoglycemia oh, along with um, coming off this medication. And you definitely, I mean, I cannot state this more seriously. If you're coming off an antipsychotic, you cannot do stimulants. You cannot drink coffee. You cannot drink tea. You can't get, leave the monster drinks alone. And definitely don't be snorting Adderall or smoking meth doing this because it will turn into a catastrophe. What may have worked on antipsychotics to give you a bit of levity is not going to be the same thing that's going to work when you're coming off it. You need everything to kind of tap this down. If you're too tired, whatever you're doing, like if you're taking um, you know, other nutraceuticals and stuff, that's good because that gives you an opening to continue maybe more a little bit with the medication withdrawal. Um, you don't need the stimulation. Anything, you don't need any more stimulation than this drug is going to do for you coming off of it probably. So um, when you're coming down this mountain, right, and you're coming around each one of these taperings, it's like a switchback corner. You know, Each one of those places is going to need to go at a speed that you can actually get around that corner. So if a person's perseverating too much about the religion or they're um, obsessing about some female or male you know relationship thing and it's like whew, you can feel that that's too much then it is it's too much you might have to slow it down so obviously you know when a person starts feeling good you know because the dopamine rush feels pretty good um it may be hard to get those levels of agreement to go back up because no i feel fine this is i felt wanted to feel this way forever <sighs> these are hard to navigate these kind of things um sometimes getting a um <clears throat> a bit of a um an agreement like a written agreement that as i'm coming off this med if so and so you know they pick a pick a person that they feel can can um, intervene like you know choose you know sally to be my intervene person and if sally tells me <clears throat> i need to go back on my medication um then you can contract for that sort of safety um that might work 25 percent of the time it's, it's not certainly it's not a um, guarantee but sometimes you can say, hey, I, we love you very much. Look, you, you, you agree to this thing, and you, tr you said you would trust this person because they have your best interest at heart, and um, you just need to slow down a bit. Um, sometimes that might, be the, that might be the wild card that could pull it out. Uh, there are bridge medications that, um, that can help with this. Um, Depakote, again, and not another, another Doug... <laughs> Another drug that's not that great is um, Depakote, but the benefit of Depakote is that it acts on a different pathway than the dopamine. So Depakote is believed to be acting on the um, on the GABA pathways, making GABA more effective, and it can be like the brakes going around those corners. Um, usually, if you're coming off Risperdal, let's say you go from three to two, you know, it's, it's the Depakote might be something that you use when you get down one and below. And it could be for a short period of time in order to just get the antipsychotic out of a person's system so that they're transitioned off of it completely. Then they're on the Depakote. And most of the time, the Depakote is a lot easier to get off of than the antipsychotic. Um, again, these things take time. You could potentially see some of the most absurd things you've ever seen coming off these meds. Uh, you may have hiccups. You may have a place where there's rehospitalization that happens that you did that you needed to do for person safety that's just telling you you went too fast that, that it's not necessarily saying the person's broken again if the person is having 
symptoms some of the times and not others, if it's working some of the time, it's not broken. You know, it's not broken. If these medications are actually working for someone, our clinical observation is that uh, that's a good indicator that that's the person that could be off these medications too, because these medications don't necessarily fix a broken brain. A broken brain meaning you have organic brain damage. They take an elevated dopamine incident and they bring it back into check. But there's other things that could have been causing that elevated dopamine incident, like drug use, like um, low blood sugar, you know, like the Adderall, like the marijuana, the mushrooms, you know, whatever. There's a lot of times there's reasons why they a person spun out in the first place. Um, a bad diet, believe it or not, can be a setup for this sort of thing. You want to eat protein-based foods, you know, something that uh, has a good content first thing in the morning that's going to balance out your blood sugar. Living off of white sugar, white rice, white flour, um, sugar, alcohol, um, starchy, simple starch stuff, and not having the counterbalance for that is another way to get your blood sugar going on the roller coaster ride that could accentuate some of these other underlying situations. So some of those mechanics have to be put into place in order to even be able to consider this withdrawal in the first place to not be catastrophes. So um, this is one of those type of withdrawals that you are going to want someone to help guide you. Um, I know it's sort of a lean world out there. People have to do this stuff on their own. Um, I'm not dismissing that. If you can't find someone to do it and you're doing your research, um, you know, I encourage you to, um, to um, you know, take the, take the steps in life that are going to give what you feel is the best quality in life. Um, these are hard to pull off, you know, um, outpatient. And uh, even here, you know, where we've had 15 years worth of experience, you know, you have your stunning successes. And sometimes you have your fiery, you know, I mean, it, on these particular medication withdrawals, when you get it right, everybody's like, oh, my God, because it gives you, you've, uh, it's kind of like you've done a Chris Angel trick. You know, you just had a motorcycle appear on stage, but sometimes a motorcycle doesn't always appear on stage too. And it can, it can be, um, you know, it can be very um, 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 dramatic when a person is spent out from these sort of withdrawals. So uh, I do not want you to take anything I've said here to be medical advice. Please don't um, um, change your medications without somebody following you. Um, if you want to uh, participate in the Alternative Med Center, we are a residential program, and um, there is uh, we do have the ability to take um, certain insurances, and um, obviously it's a residential level treatment, so there is a cost associated with it that may be out of reach for a lot of people. And um, I truly wish, especially for antipsychotic withdrawals, that there was a way to offer this for free, because so many people need it, and antipsychotics are like, oh, everybody's worried about opiates, and everybody's worried about benzos, and not... Not, not saying that those are not concerns, but the the hooks that this type, this class of medications has surpasses that so far. And the amount of help that these folks need is so much more than somebody coming off opiates or even benzos that um, we, as a, as a professional community and as a um, tribe of defectors, I guess, um, need to really um, put our heads together to try to figure out how can we support people here. Um, last question, question number six is Resveratrol like in Vega? Resveratrol is very much like in Vega. In fact, um, I do believe that um, in Vega, also known as paliperidone, is the, when, when you have a patent on a drug and the patent runs out after seven years, I believe it is, you have to um, um, create a new drug. And so they just kind of, change this drug a little bit to make it into a Mendega. Um, sometimes people use Respidol or we use Respidol. When a person's on the injectable in Vega, and the first step in their process is to, um, to come down off of that injectable over to an oral and then come down off the oral. So um, we use um, Respidol as the analog for Vega. I want to thank you for taking your time either this day or evening and um, have a good day or night. And if you need to call us, um, there's a phone number that you'll see on this page. And also don't forget to subscribe so that you will continue to get um, videos from us. Thank you very much.